I'm going to go ahead and get started with introducing myself and the series, and that will give people uh, time to come in. And uh, that's the least interesting part, and that will maximize the most uh, time for spending with our guests and for hearing from them. So hello, good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world, for some people quite late, for some quite early. My name is Beth Novak. I'm a professor at New York University and director of the Governance Lab and Action Research Center on Innovations in Governance. I'm also a senior fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge, which is the host, along with the GovLab, of this series on the future for democracy. Um, and I thank you to them for their hosting and for the closed captioners. Uh, for making this event accessible. Again, if you're just joining us and you need closed captioning, please feel free to click the button at the bottom. The Future of Democracy series is our hopeful and optimistic conversations that we have with democratic innovators, technologists, dreamers and thinkers and other people helping us to think uh, perhaps less about the problems of democracy and more about what we can do to fix those problems. So I'm really delighted today to welcome Jonathan Collins, Assistant Professor of Education at Brown University. Jonathan's research examines how democratic processes can improve the educational experiences of students in low income and minoritized communities as well as the ways in which people of color, particularly African-Americans, engage with American democracy. He is joined by John Gastel at the, uh, John Gastel is a distinguished professor in the Department of Communications, Arts and Sciences and in Political Science at Penn State University. He's also a senior scholar at the McCourtney Institute for Democracy and John, whom I've known for a long time, as one of the real pioneers and years in the field of democratic innovation and deliberative democracy. His research focuses on both the theory and the practice of deliberative democracy, especially as we'll hear today how small groups of people make decisions on public issues. We're going to use the jumping off point for our discussion as his, uh, his most recent book, which is called Hope for Democracy, How Citizens Can Bring Reason Back into Politics, which he published this past year, this year, 2020, with Catherine Knoblauch, um, I would be remiss though if I didn't mention, uh, I can sort of tickled to do so if you don't mind that he is also the author of This Is Your First Novel, I believe, John, uh, which is called Gray Matters and that just came out this fall. We'll have to have you back. That's another series IPK, uh, uh, I'm sure will be very interested in hearing more about the novel. But I also wanna single out somebody who's in the audience with today and who will be promoting to join us for the discussion and that is Ned Crosby. Ned is the American inventor of the citizen's jury. He is the granddaddy of democratic innovation. It is his work in pioneering and inventing the citizen's jury back in 1971, which inspired the Oregon Citizens Initiative that you're gonna hear about today. And so many of the democratic experiments in recent years, whether it's South Australia's use of citizen juries to decide about its nuclear policy or the British Columbia Citizens Assembly or the use of mini publics now in lawmaking in the Brussels region or the Irish constitutional review process which uses a citizens assembly. It seems like everybody has finally caught up to you, Ned. So I'm just thrilled that you could also be here as well and we'll bring you into the conversation with John and with Jonathan. Uh, and with that, I will again kick it off. And for those people who are just arriving, let me just remind people, please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself for back channel, for comments. We love to have a lively discussion. For comments or questions that you want the Jonathans to answer and to respond to, to oh, that should go please in the Q&A. And uh, we will engage people in bring you in to have that conversation. What we do is we'll have a formal conversation stream live on YouTube until six o'clock. At six o'clock, we turn off the live streaming. We promote everybody to panelists and we engage in what I like to call virtual cheese cubes or virtual wine and cheese. Uh, and we have a more informal non-streaming discussion um, it's our, you know, the best we can simulate the concept of wine and cheese uh, um, by making everybody a panelist and that will allow us to have a more relaxed conversation. But for now, let me dive in and I'll start with you, John, and really just help to kick us off by explaining to us what's the problem in our political system 
that the Oregon Citizens Initiative really solves? And what doesn't it solve? Um, all of these deliberative experiments, what do you see them as being the solution to? Well, in the case of Oregon, just a, a quick introduction of the concept. The Oregon Citizens Initiative Review gathers a small random sample of Oregon voters, gives them about four days to study a specific ballot measure. They then write a one page analysis of that measure that goes into the official voters guide. So every voter in Oregon can see what their fellow citizens think they need to know. You know what are the key pieces of information, best arguments, pro and con. So what problem is that trying to solve? Initially, in my mind, and I, I think in Ned's, the low information voter, is the problem there that so many people vote, whether it's on candidates or issues, uh, with just very little information. I think over time, the updated version of that would be, we're equally concerned about the misinformed voter. Um, so with ballot measures, sometimes that's a, a key fact that's getting distorted. But sometimes these ballot measures are written in such a way that it's not always even clear what a yes vote means relative to a no vote. Some of the things that people have on their ballots, for instance, are removing a state regulation. And so if you're voting yes, you're saying no to the regulation. Basic things like that. In Pennsylvania, we voted recently to establish a retirement age for uh, justices. What so many voters didn't realize is we already had one. This was raising it. Um, so sometimes the intention to do something is uh, kind of the opposite of what you wind up expressing through your ballot because you didn't understand really what the underlying question was and what was at stake. I maybe want to just quickly also ask Jonathan the same question to see if he agrees in terms of where you see the, what you see these democratic experiments, these deliberative experiments as really solving. Well, to, I, I guess just to build on, on John's point, you know, I think in addition, you know, this, you know, there's so much that's happening in the middle that is also sort of distorting this sort of uh, process of getting from uh, you know, voter who needs to make an informed decision to actually making that decision. And that's sort of interest groups. And that is like a lot of sort of partisan bickering. And that is, uh, a, you know, sort of being inundated in people's preferences or not even really preferences, people's just sort of opinions on social media. And, you know, and John talks about this a, a lot in the book as well. It's like, how do we actually sort of move some of these sort of obstacles and, uh, and really distractions uh, out of the way and really get a sort of a direct conversation between you know voters, the proper information that they need to have to make an informed decision, and then get us to sort of a better collective decision. Because at the end of the day, these processes are important because you know if we have people collectively making the right decisions, or at least uh, sort of accessing the proper information to make collectively informed decisions, you know, is democratic uh, sort of is sort of deliberative Democrats. The thing that we believe is that this is the thing that gets us to a better sort of political society. So again, in it, moving a lot of these distractions that, I, that, that we think sort of exist in the middle, whether it's like hyper-partisan bickering, whether it's interest groups that are just are pursuing their own agendas and not really interested in what's better for the, the society as a whole. I think those are the kinds of things that these type of democratic experiments actually help sort of move us past. Before we, uh, you know, really dive in on this further, I just want to make sure, John, you've given us a little bit of an introduction to what the CIR uh, process is, but I think it might be worth just teasing out for people a little bit more about this method in particular, what it, how it works and what it, how what it doesn't do and sort of how some of these, and for both of you, how some of these methods differ from one another. So one of the things that sets the Citizens Initiative Review apart from so many other experiments in kind of civic, civic engagement that is supposed to be deliberative, uh, these things are often called mini publics. What makes the CIR different is that it's, it's not a body of people trying to give the answer to a question, right? It's not trying to establish a new electoral system or suggest what needs to be put on the ballot. It, it has a very constrained agenda right? The, the Oregon State Legislature established it, so it's an authorized process. It established a commission, and that commission hands the CIR panelists an issue that's already going to appear on the ballot. Uh, they prioritize issues that are going to have the biggest impact. Uh, and then that freshly collected random sample that's in the Citizens Initiative Review understands that their job is not to tell voters how to vote. Jonathan was referring, for instance, to, you know, we want people to, to vote correctly, right? They don't know what the right answer is, but they know the difference between an answer that has some information and, and some thoughtful consideration behind it and just wild guesses. 
right? So what they're trying to do is help people get to the point where when they vote on measure 72, they, if asked by a survey interviewer, such as my team, uh, they can say things like, oh yeah, no, I, I know the answer to that factual question, or yes, I've considered that trade-off of voting yes on this measure. If those things are present, some information, some consideration, then we're more confident that the vote reflects uh, what they really think needs to be done after having deliberated a little bit. So it's kind of a deliberative voting process uh, that's aided by a very small deliberative group, but involves a mass public. And that distinguishes it from a lot of many publics that are out there. And I just want to bring in, uh, uh, we're going to have lots of Q&A later, but there is a clarifying question in the Q&A, which is, uh, you know, really to sort of clarify this question about misinformed about what or underinformed about what. Um, and what you see as being sort of the specific nature, kind of the information that's shared in these cases, what it is that is that people are learning that we think makes this a more deliberative electoral process. Well, just to take a concrete example. Uh, the very first issue that a citizens initiative review looked at was a mandatory minimum sentencing law for two different categories of crime, one of which was repeat sexual offenders. One of the things that became apparent in the course of several days of deliberation, again, the kind of thing that doesn't become apparent when you watch a TV ad or, or read a couple of commentaries quickly before you vote, is that that actually would refer, for example, to a 17-year-old high school student sending two explicit pictures to a 14-year-old high school student. That's a 20 year plus sentence. Uh, even the proponents of the law acknowledged that, that that wasn't their intention, but they couldn't deny that that is what it would do if that was enforced. Well, that's the kind of thing that comes out in deliberation. And you can bet that appeared in the statement that was went into the official voters guide that Oregon voters saw. So it's, it's sometimes revelatory about things that are not obvious in the law. Um, but sometimes it's addressing things that are quite explicitly in the law, but are, won't necessarily be seen by a voter because the law itself is so complex that it really requires a year of law school to understand that one page written by your fellow citizens can make things that are even explicit in the law much clearer and easier to understand. And I think you're also getting a clarifying question here about uh, whether many publics rely on policy professionals to write, or in this case, let me not say mini public, let me say the CIR, rely on policy professionals uh, to write the legislative initiatives that they deliberate. So maybe if you can just fill in a little bit more detail to help people understand. Sure, and I'll give a comparison. So uh, the British Columbia Citizens Assembly was a mini public that was tasked with writing new election laws, specifically, how should we be uh, counting votes in elections so we don't get distorted outcomes? Right, that's a very specific policymaking charge that is much more challenging in some ways than what the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review does because they have no say in what laws are being put on the ballot. Whoever can gather the signatures and get their initiative put on the ballot is, is gonna be uh, put to a vote in that election. All the CIR does is comes in later in the policymaking process and then analyzes that proposed law and provides that information to voters. One would hope that downstream, the very presence of the CIR would affect what kinds of laws get signatures and how you how you phrase those because you know you're going to have to go through this gauntlet so it can have some neat indirect effects on other stages in this process but its job is still really constrained to analyzing things that have already qualified for the ballot and i'm curious really maybe let me uh ask this of jonathan uh and bring him into the conversation here is really the significance here of tying this deliberative process to an electoral process or a voting process as opposed to a governance process uh, in thinking about how the relationship between institutions and deliberation, um, what the you, how you see the role of the CIR versus other kinds of democratic experiments that you've looked at? Well, I think, you know, what makes the CIR unique is, uh, is this sort of, you know, it has teeth in the sense that it's uh, sort of institutionalized. It's something that, you know, the Oregon State Legislature has implemented as John, you know, sort of just spoke about, but then it's also something that doesn't overstep its boundaries. It still, it still makes recommendations to voters. And then it still allows voters themselves to have to come in and make an informed decision. And then basically the, C, the, the, the uh, sort of the, the chosen 24 uh, essentially allow voters to sort of sift through a lot of the, again, like I mentioned earlier, some of the distractions that might come in the, the campaign aspect of, uh, of a ballot measure and to really determine, okay, what is really being said here? What's really at stake? What is a 
vote in support do? What does a vote in opposition actually do? And therefore, I'm better positioned to make a more informed vote. Now, there are, um, and you know, John talks about this in the book as well. But there are also, I, I you know, there are also initiatives that have even they go they go a step further and and have a different level of empowerment, like a, like a participatory budgeting initiative, you know, where you're act where you know citizens are actually deciding the extent to which um, you know government resources are going to be allocated, you know, how how actual public dollars are going to be spent. And it seems like in the US, we've been a little bit more hesitant to do that. There is the participatory budgeting project that has been expanding in New York, but we haven't seen the national explosion and this kind of commitment to really trusting the public to make decisions as a collective and uh, compared to how we've seen it take off in other parts of the world. And really to connecting it back to your the original question more precisely, Beth, you know, one of the things that we see with participatory budgeting in particular is it becomes a major facelift for the parties that embrace it. You know, the 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 uh, liberal parties in Brazil that were embracing participatory budgeting at the local level, they this became a part of an entire sort of rebranding to where now constituents were becoming more and more trusting of the party leadership, and this actually helped them expand their political power while they're also sort of empowering others. You see the same thing happening in the British Columbia uh, with the um, citizens assembly there. This became a way to have a sort of a party facelift. So the irony of what we see here in the US is we, the political party, the, the, the two main political parties kind of shy away from these more sort of empowering uh, means of engaging in, demo, uh, in sort of democratic engagement. And honestly, it's something that could actually strengthen uh, the brands of the parties and actually um, ex expand their reach. But we haven't seen that. And that's probably one of the more concerning things heading into to 2020 that's actually not up for discussion in the, in the media and the sort of overall kind of election uh, election banter. I'd love to probe both of this, the resistance on the part of parties and institutions, but also I want to start with the what, what some resistance on the part of individuals. You know, John and Catherine write in the book about how, if I remember correctly, about 10,000 invitations were sent out to get about 350 people responding to say they would participate in the CIR and then 24 were chosen. And again, 24 was all that you wanted and needed, um, but the, should we be concerned that people are simply not interested? Uh, is that a worry? Yeah, um, Jim Fishkin, uh, who created the deliberative poll, has actually written about this explicitly. That's one of his uh, couple concern he's had about the CIR is the, the low response rate, right? So for a deliberative poll, they go out of their way to get a very high response rate, very strong incentives to participate, and so on. Um, and the folks in Oregon were a little less concerned about that uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, one is just the, the sheer cost, right? Not everyone can afford uh, to the cost of getting such a high response rate. But the second is that it's it's a different body in that, right? If if you if you want to get that high response rate, you may be creating a body that itself is going to kind of legislate in a way. And you have to be more concerned about the precision of that random sample. For the Citizens Initiative Review, they use a stratified random sample. So it's not, not truly random. Um, they stratify by basic characteristics like geography and demographics and so on. Um, and they just want to make sure they get a diverse group because it's going to take a super majority to get any single sentence into that statement. Um, and it tends to be very collaborative. Uh, people who are pro or con, you know, will write, help write the pro and con statements. Um, and people who even disagree with an argument that might be being made, they, they still think it's an important argument to be put in there, but they'll help clarify it, right? So there's a little less concern about that, but it is still a paid random sample. A lot of these mini publics, and I think they should, use some kind of compensation, not just covering your expenses, but honoraria, again, to boost up that response rate uh, and make sure you're getting a broad cross section. If, if there's any one demographic that I think is underrepresented, it's probably the higher income individuals for whom being paid the average wage of the state of Oregon is just a dramatic loss in income for that short period of time. Um, but you know what, they're probably pretty well represented already in the political system. So that hasn't really worried me and they're choosing not to participate. Are we concerned, therefore, about the representativeness and therefore the legitimacy of who participates? I mean, there's a, there is a stratified random sample, but obviously the people who say yes have certain inclinations in terms of their civic mindedness, in terms of their, it's not just a matter of income uh, and location. 
Uh, I'm wondering if that is a good thing, a bad thing, or isn't, isn't a relevant concern to how these bodies get constructed. Jonathan might have more to say about this. I'll just add one detail, which is there is a group, Beth, that I think in the spirit of what you're saying appears to be overrepresented and it's probably moderates. Um, so it, this process may be a little biased away from partisanship. I don't think that's a big hindrance, but it is something worth noting. And, and that's just an interesting point too, because so much of the political science literature has been suggesting that moderates don't really exist. But then when you actually look at how people are responding um, and sort of forming preferences on specific uh, ballot measures, you actually see quite a lot of ambiguity suggesting of like moderate um, preferences. But then I think, so another issue that, you know, CIR confronts is it's a heavy lift. You know, it's, it's what, five days that you have to take off work, you, you leave home, and then, you know, you go to Salem and then you're participating in this basically week-long conference. It's like, you know, we're fortunate in, in political science and, and really in academia, a lot of us, you know, we can go to conferences every year. Our universities provide funds for us to do this. Uh, and it's kind of baked into our profession. And for folks who don't have that kind of flexibility to be able to do something like that, you know, it's challenging. And then you also see, you know, you could also confront issues in terms of making sure that you have um, sort of balance, uh, sort of balanced presentations or just sort of equal access to balanced presentations. You know, one of the things that comes up in the text is, uh, what is it, the, um, the, the pro-education spending Oregon group, uh, group in Oregon that decides to boycott, um, you know, the, the CIR and so sort, of, sort of politicizes it in a way. And the issue really becomes the fact that their messaging was wrong. Um, and it really had nothing to do with the extent to which the panelists had any kind of preconceived ideas about what they were saying. But these are the kinds of things that could happen. You know, the people who are supposed to come and provide the kind of like information on the pro or the con side that helps the panelists make the proper decisions. These people themselves, you know, could, you know, you know, be coming for a political agenda. They could be sort of themselves sort of not necessarily putting together the most uh, coherent message that articulates their stance. So between the issues with the presenters and then also just the heavy lift that can come along with participation, I think that's the biggest obstacle. And we, if we can find ways to make sure that we're sort of systematically reducing those barriers, I think CIR has the potential to really be a national standard. I already think it does, but I think that will make it even bigger and better. I want to push you though on two aspects of this and then I will, uh, uh, I have a long list of questions for you which I will not ask because you have so many coming in in the Q&A and I want to open it up to our participants here. Um, but I want to follow up on this issue of who participates and representation and really ask you if, you know, this idea of the legitimacy of the process being derived from having some kind of random sample or stratified random sample um, is whether, you know, given the historic disenfranchisement of women, of people of color, of low income individuals in our political system, um, whether a representative sample is actually legitimate or even desirable. Uh, I'm curious why we're not un oversampling for groups who are otherwise disenfranchised from our normal political processes. Yeah, and uh, that oversampling. Oh, I'm sorry, Beth. No, no, please, please, please. I'll the oversampling, I, Beth's point is not hypothetical, right? The British Columbia Citizens Assembly, the Australian Citizens Parliament, in both cases, they were concerned about making sure they had a critical mass of Indigenous uh, participants. Um, and you could actually see in the Australian Citizens Parliament, it had an impact on their final recommendations, a, a quite explicit one. So under certain circumstances, that that is the idea and the ideal. Um, in Oregon, I, there was a real concern to try to just keep it as lean as possible, as uncomplicated as possible. And two choices. One was just to use registered voters, right? That already uh, slices the population up a bit. Uh, and then second, to stratify based on these kind of straightforward demographics, but to not oversample uh, because of the political challenges that would raise in Oregon. So those decisions, I understand. Uh, there was something incredibly uh, uh, striking the very first and second week of the CIR back in 2010 when it started that speaks to the fact that this process appears to be doing something good. Um, 
when the first uh, female participant said uh, they were introducing themselves on the first day, she said, you know, I, I just had a thought. I, you know, I came here last night, like the rest of you, and here we are in the morning, and I'm realizing that this is the first time since our first child that I have actually spent a night somewhere where my children weren't. And that bothered me a little when I, but now I'm thinking it might be, it might be great. When three women out of 24 said the same thing, they were blown away that anyone else had experienced that. I thought, okay, that's interesting. When the second week it happened again, I thought, okay, I think they've figured out a way of structuring this that works for some folks who otherwise don't feel they can participate. But even then they actually changed it to four days and straddled the weekend because they were having too much trouble with taking out a work week. So you, know, you adapt these things, but there are some little victories along the way that are suggesting they are reaching a group that, that doesn't usually participate in this kind of intensive way. Jonathan, may I uh, bring you in on this question, especially because you do write and st you study and you write a lot about race and politics. So I'm really curious about your view, whether the representative sample is legitimate. I think it's, I think it's legitimate as one pathway. But then I think an additional pathway uh, would be to, um, you know, sort of recreating these initiatives like a CIR uh, with uh, not even just an oversample, but with just a sub, just a sample of people who are sort of directly impacted by these issues in particular. So, you know, if we're having an issue on the ballot that is about uh, women's rights, we should probably have an entire mini public composed of women from diverse backgrounds within uh, across that sort of gender dimension coming together and having these uh, these deliberative discussions the same thing about policies that are extremely racialized you know we should have opportunities where you know the sample itself is composed of racial and ethnic minorities who are directly impacted by this issue in a particular kind of way coming together and weighing the information because you know, the one, of, one of the reasons why I think this is important in particular is because there's this kind of latent assumption, especially uh, of, of, of when thinking about African-Americans as political participants, that, uh, you know, it, there's a monolith that, you know, all follow the same party, all have the same preferences, there is no diversity in thought. And one of the things that, I, that attracted me to the study of deliberation was it really debunks that assumption about everyone. Like, you know, deliberative theorists do not think that everyone holds the same, the same preference, the same opinion, that there is really no such thing as groupthink. And if we actually uh, allow ourselves to have these discussions, that we give people incentives to pursue different types of information beforehand, and they can come together and have discussions and, and put their own perspectives and experiences into those discussions as well, we could see that there is so much variation just in terms of how we view issues and I think that gets us closer to making recommendations on issues, again, that directly impact certain subgroups. And then that becomes the message that begins to sort of spread to the rest of the community who's making a political decision. I think some of these subgroups, like folks of color, like women, the decisions are made by people who don't, who aren't necessarily directly impacted by the, by the, the policy issues themselves. So again, I think CIR and a lot of these deliberative innovations have the capacity to do that. And it's just a matter of focusing on on these folks as the sample. One more question from me, and then we're gonna go over to our uh, Q&A, uh, since there's so many questions coming in. Uh, I may reserve some time at the end for the many things that I wanna ask you. Um, but in this very series, we had Rosalind Fuller a couple of weeks ago. She's the author of a new book called In Defense of Democracy. She is deeply critical of mini public like things. Uh, the gist of the argument is that in this day and age of new technology, the idea of having 24 people, while it harkens back to ancient Athens, we're not living in the fifth century BC. And it's a little bit another, you know, part of the representation question is, isn't it just too small? Or put another way, uh, what do you see as being the implications for uses of new technology to scale some of these processes? Um, and again, to scale them by making them bigger or to scale them now more nationally, uh, do you, are you hopeful uh, or not? So a couple things. Uh, there's a lot of points to take up there. Uh, one is that what you see with the CIR or the British Columbia Citizen Assembly or the Irish example is there are ways of connecting these small deliberative publics with mass publics, right? In the case of British Columbia and Ireland, things that came out of these mini publics were put to a larger vote. 
And I, I think what we're, what we're seeing is a lot of democratic innovation that's trying to have a participatory element that is maximally inclusive and is encouraging everyone to take part and a deliberative element. Even participatory budgeting, which has one of those words baked right into its name, people who run those processes are very keen to talk to deliberative Democrats about how can we make this budgeting process more deliberative? I, I'm excited about who's participating. And in some cases, underrepresented groups are overrepresented in who votes in participatory budgeting, but they're concerned about the quality of information getting to them to help them make those choices uh, to best reflect their own reflective interests. So I, I appreciate the spirit of the criticism, but it, it, for me, it kind of misses the mark because there are lots of innovations that are trying to connect uh, smaller deliberative experiences with mass public participation. And I do agree that uh, a lot of online innovation uh, could help with that. I, I don't think existing social media networks are particularly helpful in this regard, but there's a lot of innovation yet to be done there. Jonathan, anything else you want to add or shall we go over to the Q&A? Um, I, I would agree. I mean, I think the only thing that I'll uh, add to is just to kind of re sort of emphasize the framing that I that makes me really like enjoy the text in particular, which is that, um, you know, we're in a moment that is malleable. You know, democ like our sort of political society is not fixed and we should be constantly looking for, re for ways to innovate. And if we see sort of like Athenian democracy as a failure, I think that is kind of a shortcoming. I think we should see it all as part of a sort of a longer trajectory towards the sort of improving the way in which we structure and run our institutions. And, you know, there at one point Athenian, Athenian democracy was, is it, was itself a democratic innovation in the same way where we're at this point now where this two party system uh, with these sort of mass elections where so many people feel like they don't have any kind of say or any kind of control in what happens, we clearly are at this point where we need new sort of democratic innovations. And, you know, is CIR perfect? No. Are some, are any of the sort of democratic innovations that democratic, that deliberative Democrats are coming up with, are they perfect? No. Deliberative polls? No. None of these things are perfect. But again, if we don't engage in this kind of experimentation, we'll never really get to something that gets us closer and closer to that kind of perfect society where we can all be a part of a mini public and sort of a larger public simultaneously. And we get this fluid transmission of preferences or really just identifying problems and solving them as a collective. Great, I wanna bring in our first few people to ask their questions. Uh, you can also start to take a look at the Q&A. There are some, they're all different flavor of question. Um, so let me go over to Jose Marti first. I think I might have asked his question now that I see it, but uh, since it's six hours later in Barcelona, um, it, it, we're going first to Spain and then over to Finland for the first questions before we uh, they fall asleep on us. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, John. Um, yes, I, I, actually, Beth uh, already made the, uh, the question to you, but uh, if, if I may insist just for a little bit. Uh, so I was curious to know why uh, did you chose uh, to have only 20 something, 24 people in, in the panel? Why not uh, going for 60 or 50 or 70 as in many other many public uh, experiences, uh, which might at least provide more kind of uh, representativeness, I guess, uh, and, and might, um, you know, re respond to some of the anxiety, some of the concerns that some people have uh, here. To this, I would point you to an experience I'm having with six co-authors on a paper. Um, we've had weeks to write this thing and we, we can't seem to settle on it. Now, what if there were 24 of us? Oh my gosh. Even if our article was only one page long, well, now what if there are 60 of us? So the CIR, again, because it's not making decisions, it's trying to transmit information, it's distilling information from deliberation with, you know, pro and con advocates and experts. It really, it has an editorial task that isn't about editorializing, it's about writing and editing a document uh, that has to be understandable to a wider electorate that doesn't have four days to, to deliberate. So I, I think that's why the smaller size is justified because you need the largest unit to be able to function at a decision-making process that involves 
whole series of decisions. And so I, I think it works well for that. If the statements themselves weren't coming out in high quality, I'd be more concerned. But I think that's the best justification for, for that size. So and if, if I may just uh, ask you um, a follow up question. So do you have any evidence that uh, having 40 people or 30 people, uh, 30 something people uh, would impoverish deliberation? So you think that uh, there is like a maximum in, in, 20, in the 20s? No, I, I think it doesn't inhibit deliberation so much. I think we've seen very successful bodies like British Columbia with 150 and so on. Right. But would it inhibit the editorial process? Okay. I suspect it would. I think right. you'd wind up with more of a mishmash than you do. Uh, that's that's the concern. So, if, if I could add a two finger on that too, though, just really quickly, or oh, please, 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 please. Just you also have to think about how the experience. Of how the experience affects the participants. And the more and more people that you add, the more and more likely you're gonna get people who don't feel like they're adequately sort of engaging in this process. So we notice, uh, you know, sort of Marion from the text is coming after, it has already participated in a demo, demo, uh, sort of America Speaks forum. And it was so big and her voice up felt so small. And so when you decrease the numbers, you also get increased the probability that your voice will actually like have some sort of efficacious um, type of impact on what's happening in the discussion too. And that's the thing that you have to kind of figure out how to manage with these deliberative uh, experiments as well. Great, we have a, uh, I think a clarifying question uh, very much on the process from Maddie. And since he's, it's midnight, so I'll pass midnight in Finland, we're gonna just listen and rather than see him. Thank you for listening me in and, and sorry for the weird setup indeed. Uh, I, I was thinking, I, I've heard you speak a lot about the process of selecting and how it works, but but could you tell me a bit more, and maybe this is something that I missed because because it is past midnight, so I, I might have not been following closely enough, but, but what's the in, impact of these information outlets? Do they actually reach people in the sense that they actually start to make sense of, of the problems and, and opportunities and do we have any or do you have any evidence about the impact of of, of those leaflets or, or the information that comes through this process in the outcomes in the outcomes of, of people's decision making absolutely first let me just say uh thanks for joining us from finland finland and uh switzerland are actually the two countries that have tried cir pilots it's been tried a few places around the united states uh with legislation uh, written in Massachusetts, but so thank you for coming from Finland uh, into our, our session. Uh, I love the question. There were two primary research questions that the last 10 years Katie and I have focused on. One is, is this small panel deliberating effectively? Are they creating a good document, right? And the answer is, yeah, they're doing fine. I give them like a B plus, A minus, uh, which, you know, is, is perfectly good student, right? For some students, that's more than they hope for. Uh, the second question is, does it have an impact, right? You, you need a yes to both questions to make this thing worthwhile, right? If it was great deliberation, it had no impact, who cares? Uh, and for that, we rely on things like survey experiments and we do all sorts of variations in what they see and so on. And the evidence is, is very consistent. Um, I, I, having done a few talks like this, I've come to realize that I am a glass third full kind of guy. Uh, that is to say, hey, you know what? If you're shifting like the election result by 5%, or if in the case of our, our battery of true, false, factual questions, you're improving scores by maybe about 15%, you know, that's not solving all your problems. Uh, that's not even necessarily quite a half full kind of optimism, but it's a third full kind of optimism. You are having a positive impact. And I used to run campaigns. And when I talked to fellow campaign consultants and I say, what if there was a process that dropped into an initiative election, could shift the vote by about 5%, how much would you pay for that? And the answer is such a thing does not exist. <laughs> um, well, it does. Um, and it's free uh, for both campaigns, uh, but usually it's good news for one and bad news for the other, but it's hard to predict which one will prevail in advance. Um, just depends on the quality of the arguments, as Jonathan was saying, but given by the advocates and the nature of the information underlying the issue. Great, let's bring uh, a few more people into the discussion. Let me see who we've promoted. Sam, remind me, I think we, we wanted to bring in uh, his name is, I just have to check because his name shows up wrong. We have, you are not Chul Park, you are, tell us your correct name. 
It's Robert Richards. Okay, sounds just like Chul Park. <laughs> They're colleagues. Like They're colleagues. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> with this shared computer. Please go ahead. Robert, please. Here we go. Thanks. Um, hi, John. Uh, thanks for your great presentation. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for your, for your excellent presentation too. Um, I just wanted to ask we're, we're, uh, about the Oregon, there's a, there's a new process uh, uh, that is, has some relationship to the Citizens Initiative Review that occurred this summer. It's a Citizens Assembly about uh, recovery from the COVID pandemic. And um, uh, so I wanted to see if John wanted to share some uh, insights about that process. Uh, I'll keep it really brief. I, when I mentioned the various co-authors, that's actually what I was referring to. Uh, and this is the same organization, Healthy Democracy, that has convened the CIRs. They tried a pilot uh, where they had uh, 36 people in seven two-hour sessions spread over seven weeks, deliberating on a question to inform the legislature on, on how should the state adapt its COVID response. Um, what was most interesting to me was how challenging the deliberation was. And it wasn't Zoom's fault exactly. I actually think the biggest structural problem, Robert, was that seven two-hour sessions, you just keep starting the engine and then shut down. You start up the engine and shut down. Uh, and so I think the four-day deliberation, though it asks a lot of people, gives you the chance to get into such depth so quickly and stay so focused that at the end you're exhausted but you really got somewhere. And I, I felt like this process on COVID recovery did, just didn't have the depth, not just because it was only 14 hours, which isn't much really, but also because it kept starting and stopping. Thank you. Great, we have more people waiting to join the conversation. I'm going over to Kevin Elliott next. Thanks so much. Um, so that my, so, uh, hello. Um, Hi, John. Um, so uh, my, my main question is, is basically a, a, a glass is half full, glass is half empty kind of question. Um, so, you know, should we be, should we see CIRs, um, if we're deliberative Democrats, right, should we see CR, CIRs as, as, um, uh, as a victory or should we see, or should we kind of be let down by them? And so the reason I'm thinking about this is because, uh, John, as you said, and, and I think this is, um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of elections, but a lot of people aren't, um, right? And so a lot of people see deliberate democracy um, and, and the sort of uh, uh, more participatory modes as the future uh, of democracy. And so CIRs might be seen as kind of um, uh, 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 problematic because they're, they're essentially handmaidens to elections. Um, and so, you know, someone like uh, uh, Helen Landemore, for instance, right, has this sort of like post-electoral uh, uh, vision for the future of democracy. Um, and, and so, so uh, I, I'm quite sort of positive about CIRs because they, are, they have this uh, relationship to, to elections, but I wonder um, if we are strong deliberate Democrats, should we see this as, as, as not far enough? Um, is this actually something that's um, kind of putting deliberate democracy second to elections when it in fact should be promoted of something like that? Thank you. Well Kevin, if you don't mind, if I could uh, jump in before uh, before John takes it on, um, I think that's an excellent question uh, because you, know, you could argue that you know, um, you know the biggest sort of competition with um, for sort of deliberative democracy has been well, elections just kind of like they're here and they're convenient and they kind of seem to be working ish, and is you know is you know a few small people given the opportunity to deliberate is that really better than you know, everybody with this system that they feel like doesn't really work, but they at least get an opportunity to participate. And that's kind of like the, the sort of the, the conflict here. But, you know, I think we can begin to sort of reimagine how to sort of um, sort of bring the two together. And I don't think the two are sort of mutually exclusive. They just kind of seem to be framed in that way. And at the end of the day, if it's about making informed decisions, the same way it's about making informed decisions about measures, about ballot measures for the CIR, you know, why couldn't it be about making more informed decisions about candidates? I mean, imagine if, if our, if instead of whatever we, whatever that was, uh, that they called a sort of a presidential debate a couple of weeks ago, imagine if it instead it was something that kind of re resembled CI CIR, where we had a random sample of people who could come together and, and they could be the ones who formulate the questions. 
and maybe they're the moderators and they actually sort of play a role in actually sort of pinning down the questions um, that the presidential candidates have to answer that get us closer to a clear assessment of like where the two candidates stand on key issues. I just think that there's, you know, there's room for innovation here. And that's where I sort of, you know, John is, you know, a third, a third glass half full. I'm probably, you know, sort of two thirds uh, full in, in my glass when I'm thinking about just these types of, demo, uh, these types of uh, democratic innovations and their implications for federal elections. I really do think like, um, you know, we could do some incredible things if, if we're bold and innovative. But John, I'll pass it to you. Sure. So just a little autobiographical note, uh, when Katie and I were first shopping this book around literally uh, to agents at a writing conference, um, and an agent asked me, uh, what, what's the title of your book? And I said, Experimental Democracy. And he said, huh, that's a terrible title. I would never buy that. How do you want me to feel when I read your book? All right. And 10 seconds later, he had the title. Um, and Jonathan alluded to this earlier where that, you know, but when you read the book, we do actually think democracy is an experiment. So there's lots of experiments happening simultaneously, right? All kinds of innovations, some small, some huge. Uh, I count myself very lucky in my career that I was able to pitch this idea right around the same time Ned did uh, 20 years ago. And then some folks picked up on it in Oregon, implemented it. And then I felt, okay, the next 10 years of my life are studying this thing, right? I, I said I would if it happened and it happened. Well, um, I, last year's book that I wrote was called Legislature by Lot. As you might imagine, that makes a much more radical argument about the potential for sortition. In that case, uh, we advocate for a bicameral system that, that does keep elections for one body, but uses sortition for the other. So I'm not placing uh, you know, my chips on, on one number on the roulette wheel. Um, what's exciting about the CIR is it solved a very specific problem and one that is not only recognized by voters who love the initiative, but, but do worry about the information quality of, of what they see, but it's also a concern shared by legislators who view the initiative process as very much interfering with their job. And the constraints that voters put on legislatures sometimes aren't necessarily quite what the electorate intended in their view. So it was the perfect combination of incentives that leads to the democratic innovation. So maybe it's a place to start, but it's certainly not the only thing on offer. So we have another question from SJ, and then I want to uh, uh, just a, a quick warning, Ned, we want to bring you into the conversation. So uh, uh, just so you're aware, uh, I'm going to actually call on him next. So SJ, please. Sure. Uh, thank you, John and Jonathan, for a great talk. Um, um, we talked about the uh, how to uh, scale up this, uh, you know, uh, mini public, and I was curious, you know, how do you see the role of journalism and media in this uh, initiative? Because you know, I'm asking this question because in the one way mini public can be uh, connected to the general public is through uh, journalism and media institutions. So how are the results communicated to the larger public, uh, especially through the media institutions? I just want you to maybe address that issue. Jonathan may, may have a more head-on answer to this question because his research looks at whole deliberative systems, right? How a whole community might think about the school, not just, you know, some body and then an electorate. Um, but I'll give you a, a, a funny sideways question. Uh, one of the graduate students here at Penn State who I've worked with likes to call the Citizens Initiative Review statement deliberative media. That is, you know, frankly, the coverage of the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review is terrible. There, there's almost none, first of all. Well, there's not many journalists left in the United States, honestly, that, that cover state politics, really. It's, it's sad. Um, but they don't give it much coverage. It wouldn't have much impact. No. Instead, they use this, this voter guide that the state distributes and they hijack it, right? They slip a page in there and, and we're done. So, and that reaches a lot of voters. Uh, our, our surveys are showing it's reaching a lot of people. Just a, probably a bare majority of Oregonians know about it and that number is not going up. So again, there's limitations, but it's a solution to the problem of not having media that care about your deliberation. I realize it's not a direct answer to your question, but we'll see what Jonathan's got for you. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think I have a, a related response. And first, uh, SJ, I want to say uh, your uh, your online versus face to face paper uh, was one of my favorites. Uh, it's a great piece of social science. So thank you for writing that and conducting that study. Um, what I'll say, sort of related to the question, is just that. So you know, what I've been doing it are these experiments that try to test you know how we can get sort of minimizes distance between the mini public versus the larger public. And uh, it kind of really interacts exactly with what John is saying. When I sort of expose people to this idea that a, a sort of uh, 
a local school board behaved dem behave democratically, especially like they, they actually sort of went out and solicited public deliberation, um, then you know, we, I see more positive evaluations of that school board whether it's um, framed around it's sort of a newspaper clipping, whether it's showing people video footage of a school board meeting where there seems to be something resembling deliberation, um, whether that also seems to be, um, you know, some vignettes that describe um, some sort of uh, meeting being extremely deliberative. When, when uh, the extent to which it's sort of covered in the media, I think plays a big role in perceptions. So if we have, a, some, if we have an institution like a CIR, but again, it's not the, the what's related to the larger public isn't like that the CIR met, that the CIR engaged in a very sort of democratic um, process, that you know they were actually sort of seeking truth and information, that they were hearing from both sides, and that this was a very representative body. If that information isn't transmitted to the public, then you do get that disruption. But I think if we could be clear about the processes and be more transparent, about these processes and really let allow people who are a part of the larger public to see what's under the hood with the many publics. I think that can that go a long way in helping resolve, uh, resolving the problems. So just a quick process point. I wanna ask Ned if he can join the conversation with or without his video. And I invite everybody to stick around at six o'clock. We will promote everybody to panelists to continue the conversation since I think there are a lot of um, friends and colleagues here that uh, might like to catch up. Um, but Ned, I'm so thrilled that you could join us and be here. We all owe you a huge debt of gratitude. I think there's a room full of electronic room full of people here who owe you a debt. So we're just delighted that you could be here. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot that you want that, that you would like to react to, but I want to sort of close out the hour for the moment with really asking you what your crystal ball is telling you for the future. Jonathan, start us off at the beginning with sort of regret and disappointment about uh, the spread of these methods and concern about what we have to look forward to. Uh, I'm, you know, we all need a little hope for 2021. So um, what's your thought about whether the CIR model or another one of the models that are the offshoots of your brainchild uh, is going to have legs and take off and, and where you're most excited? And you're mute. Okay, uh, am I gonna come in on screen? I unmuted my video. We see you and we hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you very much. Uh, great to see all of you. Uh, exciting for me. Uh, let me answer the question that you asked. Uh, we are trying to take what we learned from the healthy democracy experiment that John talked about briefly uh, with regard to online deliberation uh, and gather uh, if we can raise the money for it. And we're not at all sure that we can raise the money, uh, but we want to raise enough money to gather 100 people uh, from around the United States, stratified in the typical way of the CIR, to uh, gather together online, making sure that we have the proper balance of Trump supporters and Trump opponents, and ask them whether there's some way that they can work together to improve uh, America's future. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we discovered uh, with the healthy democracy experiment on uh, COVID, was that uh, five or six people with a moderator is as much as you can put together on Zoom and expect the people to be able to figure out what's going on. John is quite correct about stopping and starting, but all that we would expect this group to do is to see whether they can overcome the polarization of the country uh, to the degree that they really can work together uh, once they set aside Trump and Biden and those sorts of things. Can't they sit down and say, yes, there's something we want Indeed, uh, the old aphorism about uh, united we stand, divided we fall is something that we're all aware of. We're much too divided. Can we agree on something that we ought to try to do together? And if the answer to that is yes, uh, let me then add that the only way we can raise the money is probably by getting some prominent senator to sponsor the project in some way that the senator claims he or she will use it. Uh, and only that will stimulate people to give uh, at the $75,000 level or $100,000 level that we need. Foundations are too slow to do this, and we want to run this uh, in the first half of uh, 2021. Assuming we can do that, what we would like to do 
uh, is that if the sponsor says, oh good, you think you can work together on such and such, probably not immigration, probably not one of the really big issues, but maybe a secondary issue that's important, then what uh, we would hope is uh, that we could run a citizen's jury, uh, 24 people selected from the 100 who would gather together and hear the evidence because hearing evidence is something that's done well uh, in a citizen's initiative review format of four days and is done very poorly in the online deliberations that we experimented with. Also, the Jefferson Center did experimentations with online deliberation in their project uh, um, your Vote Ohio, which is an extensive, Your Voice Ohio, which is an extensive project run by the center. So we think we know enough about getting people to work together to say, yes, we'd like to focus, but it's clear that they can't hear evidence as one can hear in a uh, citizen's jury. The citizen's jury then of 24 or 25 would report back to the 100, the 100 would consider it and uh, talk to the major sponsor. So that's the dream that I have uh, going forward. Now, I, I, may I touch on a few other points or have I said enough? No, we want to hear much more from you, but I'll tell you what, Ned, what I want to do, and actually since Ned is here and with Sam's permission, I'm going to suggest we keep the, we keep the video running a little bit longer because we'd love to hear a little bit more from you, um, even as we promote everybody into panelists for the discussion. So I'll close out the live streaming a little bit later than normal because I think we would love to hear a little. So, so why don't you keep going a few more minutes? Well, I'd like to do one last thing and I'd like my wife to stand up and show her face so much <laughs> because I want to talk about pioneers. My wife and I were the ones who decided in a meeting uh, in 1999 to go ahead with the CIR. It was invented in a bipartisan meeting uh, sponsored by the former governor of Washington state. And Pat and I worked from 99 until uh, 2011 when Oregon finally passed the law. And she is seldom, in John's book, thank you, and thank you very much, John. <laughs> she is mentioned uh, frequently in the book. But uh, uh, the other pioneers that I want to mention, because I think it's important, is Peter Dienel, who invented the citizen's jury process two months before I did in 1971. We didn't learn about each other until 1985, uh, but he was an important pioneer. And also uh, the uh, citizens assembly in, uh, British Columbia, so far as I could tell when I went up there, had never heard of the citizen's jury process. So I think they are really pioneers uh, and uh, need to be recognized as such. So um, I think that that's important. Very, why 24 people? Uh, because uh, when Peter Dienel and I finally met each other in 1985, uh, we both had discovered that 24 seemed to be the optimal number in terms of deliberation. Uh, we wished we had more, but it didn't work when we put more in. The deliberation wasn't as of high quality. So when I discovered that he chose 25 and I chose 24, both of us after 11 years of work, that just seemed a natural thing that we couldn't verify through any objective standards. It was just our experience as very experienced people. Another thing is why did we uh, uh, decide to uh, run citizens' juries in uh, from the Jefferson Center in Minneapolis uh, on voting uh, because we discovered we ran projects on voting. Some of our best projects were evaluating candidates on their stands on issues. So uh, in uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis as a, an experiment in the state of Minnesota in 1990 and then in 1992 in Pennsylvania, we evaluated the candidates uh, on three issues. In Pennsylvania, it was a senatorial race, and we evaluated the candidates on three issues uh, and got a lot of publicity for it. And as we did this, we discovered that the people who really wanted the recommendations of a citizen's jury were not so much the elected officials who really didn't want it, uh, nor uh, the bureaucrats uh, who worked in the various agencies who sometimes did and sometimes didn't, but the people who seemed excited about what the citizen's jury process was recommended were the voters. And that's what led us to go ahead. The IRS came along and prevented us from running those projects anymore. Uh, as described in my book, Healthy Democracy, a book that has disappeared and nobody reads, uh, uh, partly because I marketed it very poorly. Um, but the, um, uh, the IRS stopped us 
And the only way we could figure of getting around the IRS and giving voters something that a lot of them seemed to want uh, was by uh, doing something on, uh, in some other way. And uh, we hit upon the Citizens Initiative review of, doing it, of finding another way of giving recommendations to people on, uh, on issues. But if somebody is curious, uh, I have an article that will be coming out in the Deliberative Democracy Digest, which is a cousin to the new uh, Journal of uh, Deliberative Democracy. And that should be coming out in November in which I promote the Citizens Election Forum, which would be a very major, very large uh, uh, method for advising uh, the public on, uh, uh, on candidates. And so uh, uh, the cost of that would be about a hundred million uh, and <laughs> uh, a lot of that for publicity. Uh, but when we think about it, uh, NASA routinely decides that we're gonna send something like New Horizons to Pluto. Uh, they issue a, a, an RFP uh, for a project that will cost a couple of billion. And we think that that's very normal and not a big deal to spend a billion. It would be just astonishing to spend a hundred million on something that's much more important than visiting Pluto, much as I love that. <laughs> We're trying to save democracy. And there are people with a great deal of money. And my dream, and now here it comes, uh, is that we, you, we find a few billionaires who are willing to spend their money to work with people in uh, a citizen's jury or, or a citizen's assembly. I believe more now in citizen assemblies than in citizen's juries to work with uh, and invest in the citizens assembly who will say what should be done. So why in God's name should we give credibility to billionaires who are pumping more money into the system? Because if we can only find a couple of them who are willing to work with the people and fund the people to say who, what needs to be done, that might have power. Ned, on that optimistic note, what I'm going to do is please don't go anywhere, anybody. We're not done yet, uh, but I am going to formally end the streaming portion of the program. We will archive the video and post it on the um, on the uh, a playlist for the series so that people will have access to it and they'll have something of a manageable length to watch. What we're going to do now is promote everybody who's here to panelists so that we can have a more informal conversation. Uh, among friends and we can pick up where we left off. And I'm really, I almost wanna come back now to the question that I started with about what's the problem that we're solving um, because we have a lot of uh, different democratic deficits that are being addressed through the processes that you are describing uh, from partisanship to low information uh, um, to governance. Uh, and so I'd be really interested on in people's take on uh, whether the the work that's uh, that we're doing, sort of the, the electoral work, is really where you're excited, most excited, or whether you're most excited about some of the work that's happening in places like the Jefferson Center, that's focused really on the work of governance and uh, Kyle's planning projects with the NHS and uh, has done work in other places to um, really try to repair democracy the day after election day. So very interested in your thoughts about timing on this, but. Um, with that, let me just signal Sam, yes, we can end the recording and say thank you to John and to Jonathan, uh, to Ned and to Pat for joining us as special guests and to all of you. Um, we again, please stick around for a moment. We're gonna now uh, move everybody into, uh, into the room 